Okay, so this is part two of week nine, fast tracking from the Magellan Elcano expedition. Uh, so by the end of the 16th century, we really have the Spanish fleets returning to the Philippines, uh, again through the Pacific Ocean, uh, this time with a conquest mission in mind. Ultimately, uh, this is an attempt to establish a trading hub in the Philippines. Uh, so uh, how this was done was that um, uh, through a series of uh, expeditions, uh, local chieftains were eventually subjugated, uh, allowing for the establishment of Manila as a trading hub. And this would primarily serve the transshipment of goods and produce from Asia all the way to Mexico, that was then known as New Spain. Uh, in this interesting way, while we think of the Pacific Ocean as this expansive uh, dividing body of water today, the ocean was then thought of as a highway that connected Manila to Mexico. In fact, Manila was not governed to Spain itself and was uh, under the jurisdiction of New Spain or Mexico. Uh, and therefore, as it was connected to the Latin American world through the Galleon trade, uh, this would entail having sh uh, what is known as the Galleon ship that would sail annually across the Pacific, each traveling on opposite direction between Manila and Acapulco. So what is being shipped? So the image of the object that you are seeing on the screen gives you an idea of one of the things that uh, made this trek across the Pacific Ocean. So this luxuriant looking object is called a uh, biombo. Uh, it's clearly a corruption of the word biobu, the Japanese word for folding screen. Uh, the biombo or the biobu turned into a biombo adapted and suited to Mexican taste as suggested by the scene that is being painted on the folding screen itself uh, while using Japanese painterly convention. Uh, uh, this is suggested by the pervasive use of gold and the gold serves not only as a base on which um, the painting of uh, a scene uh, depicting in fact uh, the palace compound of the Viceroy in Mexico City uh, is then represented uh, on the folding screen. There is also an interest in marrying different painterly conventions, uh, the use of diagonal line uh, to create orthogon orthogonal recession into space, uh, conveys on some level depth but at the same time, it's not fully exploited to express a linear perspective as the organizing principle of the composition. Uh, rather, we see a, a vacillation between depth, a recession, and almost a kind of flatness as suggested by these thick building walls that suddenly sticks out and it helps to, the, to notice that uh, you know, a folding screen is also a volumetric object and therefore has that very interesting uh, texture of, uh, uh, of protrusion and recession into space, lending a kind of very playful animation to the scene that is being depicted. So in this way, alongside uh, ceramic wares, a porcelain ceramic ware, uh, as well as other types of artisanal products from sourced from different parts of Asia. And all of these made their way to Manila, where it was then sent across the Pacific uh, to Mexico, uh, connecting Mexican society with all the artisanal pro products uh, 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 that gold can buy. Uh, in turn, therefore, Spanish gold flowed the other way and made those who engage in trade very rich. It's a wealth that's built out and touched the lives of many different people in many unexpected way. After all, a port city is by definition a kind of cosmopolitan space. 
So we'll have a sense of how these port cities are in many ways literal. Uh, when we use the word literal, it suggests that the port city is connected to a coastline. It is principally situated in the coastline. Uh, so to get a sense of what was unique about Manila, as much as it was part of the Latinate sphere, many scholars would point out that the Spaniards did not impose the use of Spanish on the local population in the Philippines, uh, very much unlike what was happening in Latin America, where colonization was so total in a way that Spanish then became the principal language in which you conduct uh, and organize and even think in, right? Uh, so uh, uh, instead, in Manila, uh, the friars who were doing the missionary work took effort to actually translate uh, religious teachings into local languages in their missionary endeavors. In the process too, it created a veritably rich archive of, uh, of, of dictionaries recording what many, many Filipino languages were like during the early modern period. Uh, so uh, that was one uh, area that made Manila perhaps a bit unique within the Latinate world. Another factor that made Manila stand out and perhaps connecting it uh, more closely to other port cities in the island Southeast Asia was that uh, despite it was pretty much isolated from the regional trading network since it was a hub that consolidated goods that was then principally sent across, to the, across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but in many ways, its social dimension was very much like other port cities. Uh, in this case, actually the Chinese population here were indispensable within the larger circulatory economy uh, that situated the Philippines as a conduit of Asian goods to Latin America. So as we saw earlier, this was not just a map of China. Uh, you know, the southern map was so unique for being a map that really decentered what we understand to be the Middle Kingdom, right? Uh, so if earlier and most later maps often depict China as, as the center, at the center of the known world, this China was really slightly uh, off-center. Uh, it occupies less than one half of the area in the southern map. Uh, the real protagonist here is the South China Sea, uh, though called the South China Sea. It's really a sea uh, that connects the Philippines, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, Southeast, a different parts of Southeast Asia, uh, linking it to the Indian Ocean, and really is that sort of passage uh, through, which, uh, through which trade was conducted. So, you know, the depiction of China itself was not the purpose of the map. Uh, yes? Yeah? Uh, Therefore, uh, this is what makes this map so unique because it shows us a very different world. And what type of world it shows is suggested by the presence of uh, shipping routes, uh, indications of shipping routes with compass bearings radiating from port city like Trento in the coast of Fujian province to all the different areas covered by the map. And this is a kind of com a map of the commercial world of that time that uh, it's quite unique because there are no other maps that offer this kind of information. Uh, it therefore, is in some ways very different from something that would be produced by the court or the imperial bureaucracy. And uh, if it was anything, it would have come from uh, the merchant class. Uh, so, so we do not actually know exactly when the, and where the map was drawn or who actually drew it and for what purpose. Of course, recent scholarship suggests that it was probably produced somewhere in, sometime in the early 17th century, uh, likely by a, a, a Chinese painter, as Chinese sources are used for the place names on the map. 
and also for the shipping route. Uh, so the, prob the compiler himself was probably based in Southeast Asia, and it was also uh, there were also some suggestions that it is likely that the map was produced in a place uh, in Aceh. Uh, today we often think of Aceh as an Islamic kingdom. Uh, and nevertheless, it was also a highly cosmopolitan city. So uh, the Chinese merchant coming to trade, Aceh was uh, recognized as uh, an important producer of pepper. Uh, so a Chinese merchant coming to trade uh, would not be entirely out of place uh, in Aceh itself. Uh, and what is most interesting about the map is that it's really giving us a very different picture of China and Chinese involvement uh, overseas as well as its international linkages uh, because China is not the purpose of uh, the creation of this map. Uh, what it shows is in fact China's interaction with the rest of the world at a period of time when official documents and official views tend to generally want to project the idea that China is closed off or isolated from all that was going on. Uh, then finally, there's also another feature of the map uh, to pay attention to. So when uh, uh, conservation work was being done, uh, it was discovered that the main sea routes uh, were also found on the reverse side showing not only that this was the first draft, but that the map was being drawn uh, using a systematic geometric technique, likely using uh, data of voyages obtained from a magnetic compass uh, that was then fed through a mathematical formula to arrive at a very precise and accurate way of calculating distances. So in short, really what is so fascinating about the southern map is that it offers us a very different perspective. Court history and documents would tell us that this was a period where China underwent the period of self-imposed isolation, uh, withdrawn from the world. Uh, however, traders and residents in the southern coast of China clearly uh, were not towing the line. Uh, in fact, they were more closely connected to the cultural orbit of Southeast Asia. And this was their world rather than uh, a world that was remote and far up north. As such, um, even as we're trying to rethink what we understand to be center and periphery, I think uh, uh, what's interesting about the map is that it really shows uh, the southern coastal communities of uh, uh, China having a population that in many ways vacillates between two centers and happily embrace uh, both centers to their own advantage. One didn't need to only profess an exclusive identity you can be part of the Middle Kingdom and still be part of a different regional configuration, one that turns southwards towards the South Sea uh, in order to seek out better opportunities and livelihood. So what is this world that uh, the, 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 the Chinese communities of the southern coast of China are encountering and are in conversation with uh, during this period of trade? So this is the Boxlet Codex, or sometimes also known as the Manila Manuscript. It's a Spanish manuscript written around 1590. And what's interesting is that it contains 97 hand-drawn color paintings and illustrations depicting peoples, birds, and animals of the Philippines and the neighboring areas covering uh, you know, um, many parts of Southeast Asia, both mainland and island. It also contains Taoist mythological deities and demons, both real and mythological birds and animals from, drawn from popular Chinese texts uh, that were in circulation at the time. Uh, many seem to be copied or adapted from materials brought to the Philippines from China, uh, such as the Sun Haizing or the classic of mountains and seas. 
as well as uh, books from the Shenmuo genre, which depicted uh, deities and demons. Uh, the rest of the drawings mainly represent uh, what is called types, uh, often in male and female pairs. Uh, uh, they usually uh, a description of inhabitants uh, from various parts of Southeast Asia with their distinctive costumes. Some of them have been also uh, refashioned as warrior-like figures. Uh, so these genre of paintings about classifying people and things within the world into types would over time become the uh, foundational uh, in the knowledge system of Europe uh, from the 18th century onwards, uh, where under a movement that was called the Enlightenment, uh, a new kind of intellectual paradigm would, uh, would prioritize reason at the heart of knowledge production and assume that by classifying and, and, uh, and fixing things in their place and recognizing each and every thing within a larger order of pattern uh, uh, in nature that we are able to produce a knowledge that is objective that is irrefutable and universal. Uh, of course, then these type of genre paintings uh, of the types uh, of, had an older history, right? And actually used to serve a very different purpose. So the origin of this type of paintings, uh, this genre, uh, can be traced back to China, uh, where it was part of a court commission. These commissions were known as portraits of periodical offerings, or the zi gong tu. So some of the earliest zi gong tu's, such as the one dated to uh, the Liang Dynasty uh, in the sixth century, depict um, emissaries or ambassadors from different tributary states. But these are perhaps imaginary records of uh, these ambassadors coming to pay tribute to the Chinese emperor, acknowledging his sovereignty and over lordship. Uh, in effect, uh, these were also records of a kind of uh, ritual or reciprocal exchange through which uh, China is imagined as the big brother, uh, but in assuming the role of the big brother, then uh, the empire had the responsibility to also look out and take care of uh, the vassal states that were under its care. Later, uh, Zi Gong Tu, uh, such as the one uh, made in the Qing Dynasty, would also include uh, uh, representations of Europeans alongside uh, descriptions of what their culture is like. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, what uh, it shows is that the Boxer Codex was drawing on this older pictorial uh, convention. Uh, uh, it owed a large part of its visual vocabulary to uh, Chinese illustrations that were in many ways uh, uh, rooted in uh, a particular genre of painting. Uh, in fact, uh, the Boxer Codex itself was very lightly painted by craftsmen, Chinese craftsmen who were based in uh, Manila itself, uh, uh, where the Chinese were kept in a separate district, uh, principally to contain them. So interestingly, in Batavia and Manila, uh, special neighborhoods were created to regulate um, the Chinese population uh, because Principally, they were seen as both indispensable as well as a threat. Indispensable in the sense that the colonial economy required mediators uh, uh, of trade. Uh, and, and the Chinese uh, were principally brought in to fulfill this role. Uh, but at the same time, they were also suspicious because of the number. The population number was so large and much larger than the European population in the sense that uh, it threatened the control of a European colonial power. In a number of instances, uh, 
this would result in a quite violent backlash. The two paintings that you're seeing on the screen, uh, one painting and one uh, uh, engraving on, that you see on your screen, uh, drew on very different pictorial tradition, one religious and, uh, and spoke a language that framed uh, the conflict on religious terms, right? Uh, so you can see up here, the Manila example uh, shows how uh, there was an attempt by Chinese rebels to storm the city wall in 1603. Nevertheless, uh, how it was accounted is that uh, the rebels were driven back by an apparition of St. Francis, where you have him kneeling in front of a glowing vision of the crucifix, uh, Jesus uh, being crucified on the cross, uh, perhaps uh, in prayer, uh, uh, after which uh, in, a, in, a, in a linear sequence, uh, uh, he, he would be seen to tower over the, the rebel forces, uh, in effect driving them out of the Manila fort. Uh, at the same time, let's also nuance our understanding of how the painting was produced, the condition uh, in which it was produced. Note that it was likely uh, created by a Chinese artist, which really speaks to our point of uh, the, the kind of uh, ambivalence uh, that colonial European authorities have in regards to the Chinese population in Southeast Asia. Of course, this would take on a much more drastic turn in Batavia a century later, uh, when 50 Dutch troops uh, uh, tried to crush a revolt, uh, resulting in the sacking of uh, the Chinese quarter in its near entirety, uh, with the displacement of up to 10,000 uh, uh, members of the Chinese community. Uh, if we were to compare this uh, illustration uh, with the uh, Manila uh, painting, I think uh, it's very obvious that uh, th th it's, it operates within a very different pictorial convention. Therefore, it's also symptomatic of a shift in paradigm that has happened over the past 100 years. What is this shift? I think this is the globalization gradually made untenable the concept of the closed sea, the mare clausum, rooted in the idea that it was possible to possess total sovereignty over the sea as a space. Uh, uh, in turn, uh, with the opening up of the sea uh, to competition, to other actors, and really redefine monopoly from the way we think of monopoly as centered on a divine right. Uh, the king uh, is given the legitimacy by God, uh, principally through the priest or the pope, and therefore he has a divine right over this territory. Uh, to, uh, and this shift towards an ideological system that is centered on a belief in the invisible hand of the market. So um, when we look at a uh, illustration such as the one you see on the screen here of the sea personified as a female figure likely to reference uh, the Spanish nation as an empire, I think uh, it is also an illustration that represents an interesting moment of transition. Uh, and transitions are momentary uh, in the sense that uh, one is moving, uh, shifting from one paradigm into another. Uh, uh, it is Jaina's face in the sense that it looks backwards as well as forward into time. Uh, in this sense, uh, an illustration like this is not only indicative of a historical past where Spanish control over the Pacific Ocean was unchallenged. An illustration like this, in many ways, was also prophetic of a time to come because it is also suggesting to us 
uh, the religious palimpsest on which a new world order founded on global free market capitalism would uh, slowly emerge out of this uh, imagination. Uh, so if the 16th and 17th century, Spain still considered the Pacific Ocean as a mare clausum, a sea close to other naval powers. Uh, uh, then I think this was slowly being eroded. Uh, so to give you a sense of uh, how this uh, was being uh, imagined, the sea was always a contested domain. Uh, however, uh, because of uh, the Iberian countries, uh, principally uh, Spain and Portugal, being pioneers in the process, they were uh, also seeking for exclusive rights uh, over the lands discovered and therefore divided the world into two halves, right? Uh, uh, there's the Portuguese hemisphere and then the Spanish uh, hemisphere. Of course, this policy was hotly contested by other European nations, of course, who were uh, uh, under these treaties barred from expanding and trading. Uh, so as a result of this dispute, uh, over time, um, 100 years later, by the early 17th century, the idea of the sovereignty, of one having sovereignty over waters, became increasingly untenable. And this ushered in, ushered in a new age of Mare Liberum, or the free open sea, when faced with increased competition, uh, the model that had served the Portuguese and Spanish empires so well in the earlier period, uh, began to look outdated since these relied principally on the personal investments of the monarchy. One of the consequences was that in this new space, colonial encounters took on a very different form. Um, colonial port cities emerging during this period were still required to build forts to fend off attacks from pirates and other trading competitors. Uh, and whether they're locally born sultans or localized sultans, perhaps with foreign origins, such as um, you know, uh, the much revered Arab Hadrami sheikhs, uh, who were known to uh, have assumed uh, power as sultans, uh, are also other competing European powers. Uh, that were trading in Southeast Asia. Uh, and what's interesting is that alliances shifted constantly during this period. You know, there wasn't always a clear binary between East and West or Europe and Asia. Alliances that were made came in different configurations. Uh, important to note uh, was that new players such as the Dutch uh, who were originally more powerful, as well as the English, were not trading on behalf of the monarch or, or, or the ruler of their respective countries. Uh, so instead, they, they worked for a company and reported to the shareholders of the company. And these were known as the Dutch East India Company and the English East India Company, British East India Company. While these companies initially obtained trade monopoly under royal charter, within their respective companies, uh, the business was accountable ultimately to a board of directors, uh, so not to the rulers. In effect, we could say that, uh, that the Dutch East India companies was in many ways the first multinational corporation. Uh, uh, the corporate structure created a system of management and corruption that made uh, the running of trade so much more efficient compared to, uh, you know, uh, individual investments that ultimately stem from uh, the pockets of the rulers of Portugal or Spain. Uh, this meant that the trade policies also had to change. So uh, with Portugal and Spain, ultimately uh, it is a demonstration and assertion of sea power uh, through the establishment of forts that can then guarantee security for the conveyance of uh, the spices all the way back to Europe for sale. Uh, however, uh, 
with the Dutch East India companies and uh, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company, ultimately uh, trade is framed and on peaceful terms. Uh, unlike the Iberian Empire, they did not resort to outright conquest. If force was used, and many times it was used, it was increasingly exercised through uh, the adherence to treaties, obligations and very often framed within a legalistic language uh, that made humanistic justification for the recourse to violence uh, that, it, that happened in the past. So such was the climate of a sea that was opening up with a new corporate structure that gave more room for autonomous decision making on the part of those who sailed under the company flag. Uh, and in this new setting, a curious object emerged, and this is a scorched sheet of music titled A Malay Song. It's an 18th century song composed by a British East India Company navigator called Captain Thomas Forrest uh, around 1784, uh, set to the tune of a uh, better known uh, music, uh, Corrente Vivaci in the third sonata, uh, by the Baroque composer and violinist Arcangelo Corelli. So during this time, uh, what's interesting about this navigator is that as he was traveling across the Malay archipelago in search of favorable trading terms uh, coming in peace, he would play the flute, presented violins as gifts to local rulers, translated English poems into Malay language as gifts, transcribed local tunes and composed uh, 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 songs with uh, a Malay melody, melody structure. On some occasions, he was uh, viewed with uh, amusement by local inhabitants uh, and, and even earned the name Capitan Gila or the Crazy Captain. Uh, uh, so this Malay song is something that uh, uh, Forrest composed, uh, set his own arrangement, uh, and in fact sang before uh, the Sultan of Aceh in 1784. Uh, and uh, what, in doing so, what music scholar David Irving suggests is that uh, Forrest uh, uh, was in many ways using the Malay song as a type of currency. Uh, and this currency participates not on monetary terms, as in uh, currency, as in the monetary currency that we think of, but currency as in the kind of social currency that has great value in the oral economy of intercultural diplomacy. So by learning such songs and composing them himself, he gradually accumulated a stock of musical and cultural capital. Moreover, by engaging in musical performances for and with members of the royal families and aristocrats, he was able to increase his social political capital. And therefore, in trading the tunes, he's able to tune trade to his favor, as suggested by Irving. Uh, so when we look at someone like him, he was in such favor that he even received uh, uh, an, an award uh, from a title from the Archani Sultan uh, called the Pedang Amas. Uh, and, and he gave a, a, an account of how uh, all the courtiers, upon him receiving the award, uh, would shout out, uh, umur panjang semua tuan kita, sampai mati tidak boleh saya lupa tuan kita punya hormat. Uh, so it's something that goes like, uh, uh, long live uh, our great lord, uh, until death will I not forgive uh, the respect that was accorded to you. Uh, this was what he said. And in the 1778 portrait engraving, it showed him next to his Pedang Emas medal, uh, in which we see the figure of the traveler crystallizing himself and projecting himself as a kind of cosmopolitan interlocutor, one who operates between culture, translating, as well as figuring out the world, using whatever creative resource at his disposal, including uh, one's personal musical talents. And this helped to gain advantages within a very cutthroat, competitive environment the commercial capitalist world where one stood to either lose everything uh, or gain a return that 
to be beyond one's wildest dream, right? Uh, so what might indicate this return in the way that uh, there's an episode that, uh, that, that, that gives us a hint because Thomas Forrest then began to dream big and this dream becomes quite fantastical. In one of his sort of like uh, hope and dream, uh, uh, we see Thomas Forrest being someone of a man of his time. Uh, he was in a privileged position as a navigator of a trading company. He had access to the most advanced and accurate forms of uh, mapping maps that are out there then. At the same time, we begin to also see an individual uh, that uh, possesses all his foibles and idiosyncrasies as we read through his autobiography, including his retirement plan. So this was something that he dreamt up uh, uh, during his travel. And he said that uh, upon his retirement, he would want to create a garden with a life-size hedge maze uh, in the shape of the map of the world. Here we see the instrument of mapping as a science that aspired towards empirical, objective, rational, representational accuracy, suddenly taking on a very surreal turn. Uh, so maybe creating a garden of this scale is no less ambitious than Forrest's undertaking as a traveler, as a navigator, as a cultural diplomat uh, who has traveled and seen the world. But at the same time, think of the garden as something that is paradisal and aesthetically pleasing on the same register as it is also something that is utterly non-instrumental and ultimately whimsical. So if the European map was a new cartographical science with an accuracy or in representation that aimed to shine a light uh, on all corners of the world so that by illuminating a knowledge of place uh, agents of trade can actually profit uh, uh, from this knowledge. It is uh, therefore really ironic and in fact quite comic that uh, someone like Thomas Forrest, who exemplifies uh, the success story of this narrative, of this kind of trajectory, uh, would at the end of his life struggle to give new meaning to the map and all he could do was to turn it into an utterly inane and self-indulgent uh, gardening project that borderlines ridiculousness. And I think this is the tragic comedy of how a trader dreamed of his old age and retirement. Um, but if we want to tell uh, such stories of uh, pathos and or even bathos, uh, in many ways, uh, we have to be very willing uh, to engage uh, with these historical figures in interpretively imaginative ways that are generous to the material and open to um, new ways of thinking about how they can actually tell us uh, interesting stories about the past that makes the past